أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب إشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأهل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي الحمد لله رب العالمين ثم الصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين أما بعد فقد قال الله تعالى في كتابه المجيد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وما من دابة في الأرض ولا طائر يتير بجناحه إلا أمم أمم أمثالكم صدق الله العلي العظيم سرّات الله <clears throat> Once again, inshallah, let's begin our discussion by the recitation of Dua'i Faraj and by the barakat of these majalis. May Allah make us the supporters of Imam Zaman and hasten the reappearance of the Master of Time. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Allahumma kun li waliyaka al hujjat ibn al Hasan. سلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا بِرَحْمَتِكَ يَا أَرْحَمَ الرَّاحِمِينَ سَلَوَاتَ <coughs> In continuing our discussion around clarifying various doubts that we have and resolving some of the unclarities that develop in faith, tonight's question that we want to address is should animals be treated like human beings? The origination of this question is actually a contemporary issue. <clears throat> What's happened in recent history is we found that people have taken to dogs and other animals and have really pushed forward for the rights of animals and the appropriate treatment of animals to the extent where in some cases we've seen that our society, the American society, is more often more concerned with the welfare of an animal and the mistreatment of animals than they are with the mistreatment of human beings. And we take a look and we see that our society and our social culture is really changing quite quickly and quite drastically to promote the values and the position of animals and what they should be treated like and how they should be dealt with. And the question comes that, well, what does Islam have to say about this? The idea that, for example, some people refer to their dog as their child or their grandchildren or these various other statements, or for example, they promote the welfare of animals and they raise the status of how they should be treated. And what does Islam consider and how we should put perspective to the situation of our treatment of animals and how we should deal with them. And if we have time as we go through these sections, we'll even address the concept of the consumption of animals and vegetarianism and what the position is amongst these points. To frame the conversation, we have to take a look at first, where did this process initiate from? How did such a change come into society that now the position of animals has been raised as it's been raised in society? What we see is about 20, 20, 25 years ago, animals were not treated like this. They were recognized and acknowledged as pets, but you wouldn't dare call your animal your child. You wouldn't carry your dog around under your arm, and if you saw someone doing something like this and treating an animal as a child or a member of the family that was very close and proximal and deserved to have certain treatment and rights, we would find it strange. It would be considered odd and inappropriate in society. However, over the course of about 25 years, and, and, and there's a documented history of this, you can go back to media and you can take a look and see how animals were portrayed in media 25 years ago. 30 years ago, 40 years ago, as functional possessions that you could have or something you had as a companion. But there was a clear difference in, in, in the acknowledgement of a, how a human being should be treated and how a dog or a cat or another animal should be treated. 
And now, 30 years later, we take a look and we see that, again, this treatment is different. That now the differentiation in media of how an animal is treated and how a human being is treated, that differentiation is decreasing quite rapidly. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. One more salawat, please. So we see there's a difference that the media portrayal of how our society treats animals has changed. The question is why did it change? Before we can address the validity of this change and what do we consider, we should take a look at why it changed, what was the cause behind it. What we take a look and we see is, is that we live in a capitalistic country. What a capitalistic country means is, is that the goal of people or the way that the system of economy and things operate is what can I sell and what can I make money off of? And where is there money to be made? And about 25 years ago, when Pets.com, for example, and PetSmart and Petco and these companies were still in their initial phases, a realization came into society that there's a large market of money to be made in animal goods and in pet goods. Because you see, when it comes to the products that we produce for human beings, there's a large system of regulation the types of fabric you can use, the types of materials you can use, the quality of the production, everything has a very high standard that has to be maintained when you produce products for human beings. However, there's no such system of regulation for animals. There's no system of regulation for animals in the products that you produce for them, the toys that you produce for them, not even in their food. You can put anything in the food and sell it and you can make money off of it. And these companies, they realized that this is a market that can be capitalized upon and there's money to be made here and the margins are fantastic because the cost of production we can put the cheapest quality item and we can mark it up in value and charge a lot of money for it. So they realized that okay fine there's money to be made here but how do we now go about getting people interested in purchasing all of these goods? So they started campaigns about humanizing animals. They started campaigns about advertising and promoting these concepts that showed animals more as members of the family, more human, more a part of your life. And one of the earlier examples of this was in the Super Bowl commercials in the early 2000s. One of the initial phases of that during the Super Bowl commercial, they said, treat your children right, and they were showing pictures of dogs as children. And at that point in time, there was a bit of an outcry from society saying, oh, these people are crazy. They're talking about animals like they're children. But the message kept being built and the product market kept being built and now we're talking about over 20 billion dollars a year or even more than that annually as a market in the US for pet care and for pet products with a very low cost of entry and a very high value of production and what you can market it for. So the idea behind this and the humanization of animals in terms of what's going on in America was very closely associated with what could make money and people were interested. But as this process initiated, and this is one of the things that happens in a culture, is that for whatever reason a process begins within a culture, it becomes normalized and it becomes accepted and people start seeing the value in it because everybody's living their life that way. And our children now, they look at the idea of having a dog as if having a child and wanting it and having it in their house or having a cat and that this is a part of the family and this is my child and this is my treatment. So the question comes, Islamically, are we okay with this? What is the Islamic perspective about what the role of an animal is, how it should be utilized, and that is it something that should be given certain specific rights and treatment? When we take a look, for example, we began our discussion with a verse of the Quran from Surah Al-An'am. Now, animals in general within the Quran are discussed extensively. There are over 200 ayat in the Quran that talk about animals. And there are over six surahs that Allah has taken and named after animals. You guys know them? Yalla, ready? Let's go. See. Let's see. Six of them. Who knows? Surah Baqarah, there's one. I gave you the second one a few minutes ago. Surah Fil, that's not the one I gave you, but that's good. That's two. Surah An'am, the cattle, right? That's three. I gave you one. Three more, come on. Huh? An Kabut, okay, that's four. There's two more. And they both begin with N. 
Yeah, so you're not gonna put that thing into the kya fayda ho. He said it. What is it? There's two more. Who knows? Huh? Namal and Nahal. That's right. Creations other than human beings. There are six surahs. There's Bakara, An'am, Nahal, Namal, Ankabut, and Fil. And Allah has taken six chapters in the Quran and named them after animals. And the discourse about animals has happened frequently, including, for example, the verse that we began with, where Allah says, "Wama min dabbatin fil ardi wala ta'irin yatiru bijanahihi illa umman amthalukum." Where Allah makes the statement, He says that there is no animal that walks on this earth, or no bird that flies with its wings, except that Allah has made it in ummah, has made it a community, amthalukum, like you. So Allah is also mentioning that animals have a sense of community as well too. Animals have a society as well and a family unit and a structure and they operate in these processes and that they have a responsibility or they have a system of life like us. So the question comes then, is Allah promoting the idea that okay that these animals should be given the same rights as a human being? Or what's their functionality? And there are many other verses that for example in which Allah discusses the concept of these animals. For example, وَالْعَنْعَامُ خَلَقَهَا لَكُمْ فِيهَا دِفْءٌ وَمَنَافِعٌ وَمِنْهَا تَأْكُلُونَ When Allah describes cattle, He says, I created for you cattle. And within it is a clothing and warm clothing for you. And within it are many benefits for you. And from it you can eat. Allah then continues, He describes it. وَالْخَيْلَ وَالْبَغَالَ وَالْحَمِيرَ لِتَرْكَبُهَا وَزِينَةٌ That He says, I even created for you horses and donkeys and mules that you can ride upon them and take advantage of them and that they're an adornment and a beautification for you. So Allah discusses the idea of animals in many different senses and at other times he draws examples where he describes and he says don't raise your voices like the sound of a donkey. Certainly Allah hates the sound of one who brays like a donkey. That the sound, that one of the worst sounds is that you should sound with loud voices like a donkey sounds. So Allah describes and gives many examples of the presence of animals and the fact that animals are a part of society, they're a part of life. And in some, where we take, where Allah is describing that they have communities, the same as you. That they have environments and families and clans and they go through these processes that they are an ummah. Same as a human being. So the question now comes, What's the difference between a human being and an animal? Why do we see similarity between human beings and animals? Now, when for example in contemporary society people show similarities and say, oh these animals are like us, they have feelings and emotions, they're not necessarily talking about the physical similarity. It's not that for example we love horses because their face is like ours. Or that we love a dog because its face is like mine. The physical feature is not what we're trying to say is the equivocation on the basis of which they should be treated well. Rather what we say is, we say that we see in these animals characteristics possessed by humans. We see them for example when they want something. We see them for example when they are afraid of something. We see that things make them happy. And on this equivocation, they come about and they make the statement that we should treat them the same way we treat human beings. Because we see in them the same characteristics as ourselves. We should take into consideration their desires and their wants because they are similar to us, they have desires and wants as well. So now the question is, is where do these similarities come from? How are these similarities structured? In this, we take a look and we see that as it's not a physical attribute that's similar, it's not that, oh, because dogs have the same nose as human beings, we should treat them like human beings. Or that, you know, because an ape has an opposable thumb like a human being, we should treat it as a human being. It's the characteristic. So the question is, where do characteristics originate from? Characteristics originate from the soul. Every living thing that we know that exists possesses a soul. And that we know that the process of death is the separation of a soul from the physical body. That we as scientifically today can create a human body. We can put all the parts together, like Frankenstein, right? Take a piece from here, take a piece from here, slap it all together. And you make a human being, you make a dog, you make something else, but you can't bring it to life. The necessity for bringing something to life is the soul. So when we take a look at the idea of the soul, we have to understand what is the soul to understand why do we see similarity between a human being and an animal? What are the things that are present within the soul that describe and explain these similarities that we see? To that, 
the knowledge of the soul is something that we have limited access to. يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الرُّوحِ قُلِ الرُّوحِ مِنْ عَمْرِ رَبِّي وَمَا أُتِيتُمْ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا Allah says that when it comes to the Spirit and the people ask you, O Holy Prophet, about the Spirit, tell them that the Spirit is something from the command of Allah and we don't give you much information about these things. If you want to know about the soul, how the soul operates, there are limited sources of information that we have about the soul and that there are limited ways that we can interact with it. There's a few points to this. One is sometimes we take a look at a person's manifestation of behavior and we try to determine based upon the things that they can do, are they rightly guided or not? I'll give you an example. Uh, a Buddhist monk who can go, for example, a month without eating or drinking and he's still alive. We say it's not a physical characteristic because the physical limitation is the same as every other human being. It's something about his soul that gives him this ability. Uh, people who perform extreme feats or they have certain abilities and special characteristics. So it's not a physical presence that they do these things by, but rather it's a spiritual presence. And we sometimes what happens is when a society as a whole sees an individual develop certain spiritual characteristics, they imagine that this person has some aspect of the truth and that they are on some path of truth and righteousness. I'll give you a story. You guys want a story? You guys want a story? If you want a story, recite a salawat. There's a narration that some attribute to our 11th Imam and others to our 9th Imam that during the time of the Banu Abbas in an area where there was a very severe drought that the people were gathering together and reciting Salat al-Istisqa. Salat al-Istisqa is a unique mustahab prayer. You see, mustahab prayers, every mustahab prayer you pray, you have to pray furada. You can't pray jamaat with the exception of Salat al-Istisqa. Salat al istisqa is when a community gets together and collectively they pray to have rain come. And Allah has allowed that this mustahab prayer should be done in jama'ah. Other than that, anytime you want to do a mustahab prayer, your intention has to be furada. So for example, if you're praying here and it's Salat al-Isha and, you only, and your Salat is Qasr and you want to get up and join the last two rakats with the jama'at and make the intention of jama'at, it has to be a wajib prayer because you're in jama'at. Mustahab prayers can but istisqa, and this is an aside, is a prayer that's allowed to pray in community. So a Christian monk enters into the city and he sees everybody is leaving their shops and going to the masjid. And he says, hey, where's everybody going? They said, see, we're going through a very severe drought and we're going to pray Salat al-Istisqa. We're going to collect together as a community and make dua to Allah to send down rain upon us because of the difficulty that we're going through. So the monk says, hey, can I come? I say, yeah, sure, why not come? The monk comes, the Muslims come, they gather, they pray. No rain. So the monk says, hey, can I give it a try? I said, sure, go ahead. The monk prays, and it rains. Now when it rains, when a monk prays, and it doesn't rain when the Muslims pray, the Muslims became a little frustrated. They say, hey, I thought we were on the right religion. I thought we were on the right religion, but when we pray, it doesn't rain. And when this monk prays, it rains. So they started to question the religion of Islam. And there's two incidents of this happening in history. The one that I want to mention is a little bit different than the one that's traditionally told about Imam al-Askari. So the news went from the town to the Khalifa, and the Khalifa was told, hey, listen, the religion of Islam is in danger. People are going to leave the religion of Islam because the Christian monk prays and it rains, and the Muslims pray and it doesn't rain. So he says, how do we fix this? I said, we don't have a solution, but if you go to the children of Fatima to Zahra, they will have a solution for this problem. So the Khalifa goes to the grandson of our Holy Prophet, which is either the ninth Imam or the eleventh Imam, and he says to them, your grandfather's religion is in danger, save it. So he sends the Imam to this town, and the Imam comes, and the monk prays and it rains, and the Imam says to him, why did it rain when you prayed? The monk replies, he says, I have developed a characteristic that Allah loves so much that whenever I ask him for something, he gives it to me. So the imam says, what's that? And the man replies, he says, I trained my spirit, I trained my nafs, that whenever I want something, whenever I desire something, I do the opposite of it. 
So I never satisfy my desires. And by this characteristic that I have developed in myself, Allah has given me the ability that whatever I ask for then is not for me and Allah gives it to me. The Imam turns to him and he says, I want you to accept Islam. And the monk goes, no thank you. The Imam turns to him and says, why? And the monk thinks for a little while, thinks for a little while, thinks for a little while. He says, you know what, I'll accept Islam and he accepts Islam. So the Imam says, for the people to learn, the Imam doesn't need to know. He says, why did you accept now? He says, because when you first asked me, my nafs told me to say no to you. So I said no. And then when you asked me, why did I say no? I realized that I said no because my nafs told me to say no. And my success in life has been going against my nafs. So then I accepted Islam because I wanted to go against my nafs. And I found that maybe Allah will give me barakat in this too. The point of the story is to say that Training your spirit can develop certain characteristics in it and there are ways of developing it. You can develop it outside of Islam. There are people who are not Muslim like this monk was, who trained his nafs and in ways developed characteristics of his nafs that strengthened him. And the same way there are many different people in this world who develop and strengthen their nafs by training their nafs the same way you train your physical body. But in the way that there are right ways of training your nafs, there are wrong ways of training your nafs. We say the best way to train your nafs is the way that Islam taught us. Even amongst the Muslims, there are Muslims who train their nafs in different ways. For example, a Sufi, a Sufi is a mystic or someone who, who, who believes in the mystic characteristics of Islam, trains his nafs and character by sitting and, for example, meditating. Or he trains his nafs by sitting and repeating a dhikr millions of times. And he'll just sit there for days and months at a time no socialization, no communication. We'll do this dhikr in a process of training his nafs so that he can attain some spiritual characteristic because the spirit is an entity or a part of a human being that can be trained and developed. We say, madhab Ja'fari say, that our process of training the spirit and developing the nafs is through salat and Qur'an. Increase your prayers, increase your recitation of Qur'an. The conclusion of both of these practices may be that you strengthen your nafs and you develop certain abilities of a spiritual capacity and spiritual ability. But the difference is what happens is if you pass away before you attain that spiritual high, you attain that spiritual characteristic. In the case of a Sufi, he dies sitting and staring at a rock. If you die and you're in the process of training your soul, you die reciting Quran and reciting Salat. So the bare minimum you get is that you get some ibadat from it if you don't get the spiritual training. You guys are with me? Okay. We kind of went on a bit of a tangent here. We started talking about spiritual development training. The point of the conversation around spiritual development and training is to say is that the nafs, the spirit that exists, exists within every living creation. And we deal with and interact with that nafs on a different basis and we can develop that nafs and grow it. The question is, is that nafs the same nafs that exists in a human being? Is that the same nafs that exists in an animal? And this is where the question comes in. Is that if the nafs has the same characteristics and qualities between a human being and an animal, then yes, we should treat the animal the same as a human being. Because why? The spirit is the same, the body may change the same way within human beings. We may have all different bodies, but our spirits are the same. Our functionality is the same. I have a joke on that one too, I have a story. Do you guys wanna hear another story? A loud salawat and I'll tell you a good story. <clears throat> There's a story about Hazrat Bilal and that Hazrat Bilal was walking in the markets of Medina and a woman came to him and she was crying. And Hazrat Bilal goes to her, not you Bilal, you weren't there. Not me either, okay? Hazrat Bilal goes to her and he says, why are you crying? She says, I went to Rasulullah and I asked him to pray for me to go to heaven. And Rasulullah said to me, there will be no old people in heaven. I'm crying. I became a Muslim, I followed Islam, and I won't go to heaven. Bilal says, maybe you misunderstood. Let me go talk to him. So Hazrat Bilal comes to the Holy Prophet, sits in front of him, says, Ya Rasulullah, I met this woman, she was crying. She said that she asked you to pray for her to go to heaven, and you said, there'll be no old people in heaven. Is that true? And Rasul says, yes. I said that. And Bilal, there'll be no black people in heaven either. Bilal went to go save this woman, and now he's crying too. He says, what? I'm not going to heaven either. 
he's sitting there crying. And Rasul says, Bilal, in heaven, there are no old people and there are no differences in color. We are all the nur of our ruh in heaven. So don't worry about the idea that old or black or white, these are external differences between us. The reality in front of Allah is the same that our nafs, our ruh, is what Allah looks at. Which is why the Prophet used to describe all of the human beings in front of Allah are like the teeth of a comb. We're the same in front of Him. Don't differentiate, don't be prejudiced. So the question is, <clears throat> is this spirit the same inside of an animal as a human being? If it's the same, we should give the same rights to the animal as we do to the human being. Now, pay attention, okay? Otherwise, after this, you'll be treating horses like human beings, and that's not okay. You have to pay attention. To understand this, let's take a look at a hadith from Amir al Mu'minin Ali ibn Abi Talib. <laughs> Because you and I can't understand the spirit except by the teachings of Ahlul Bayt. There's no notebook or diary or thing that we can sit down and analyze the spirit except by the teachings of Ahlul Bayt. So when we want to learn about the spirit, we have to go back to them and learn from them. So Amir al Mu'minin says, Inna Allaha khassa al malaku bil aqli dun al shahwa wa al ghadab wa khassa al haywanat bi wa khassa al haywanat bihima dunihi. <clears throat> Amir al muminin says Allah created angels and gave them intellect without giving them desires and anger and then he gave animals the characteristic that he gave them anger and desires without giving them aqal وَشَرَّفَ الْإِنسَانُ بِأَيْتَاعِ جَمِيعِ فَإِنَّمَا he continues, he says, he says, and Allah then made man different that he gave him all of these characteristics and he honored man with these characteristics. So if you become a person who uses his intellect and ignores his desires and ignores his anger, you raise yourself to a level, high, level higher than angels. And if you prefer your desires and you prefer your anger over your intellect, you become worse than animals. So Amir al-Mu'mineen is describing, and there are many different ways of categorizing a spirit. This is one of them. One of the ways of categorizing a spirit is in three categories. That a spirit can have three different sets of characteristics present in it or features present in it. In intellect, desire, and anger. In understanding anger, what do we mean by anger is baser instincts. For example, a need for hunger, a need for food, needs. And that you can have these three characteristics present within you. And Amin al-Mu'mineen is describing the difference between the creations of Allah. That an angel is a creation of Allah that possesses intellect without having any desire and without having any needs. Doesn't need food, doesn't need water, doesn't need this thing. An animal is something that possesses desire and possesses needs and anger and fundamentals, but doesn't have an intellect. And man has all of these characteristics. The point of this to say is, we take a look and we say, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمِ ثُمَّ رَدَدْنَاهُ إِلَىٰ أَسْفَلَ السَّافِلِينَ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ Allah has described and explained this. He says, I certainly created man in the best of forms, with the best of qualities and characteristics. And then I rendered him to the lowest of the low, except for those who keep faith and do good deeds. The point of this is to explain that a human being, because of the three characteristics he possesses, he possesses an intellect, he possesses desires, and he possesses needs and anger. That's when a human being prefers his intellect over his desires and over his baser instincts, he raises himself to a level above angels because angels don't have these conflicting characteristics. They only have one good characteristic. When you choose your aql over your desires and over your anger and over your basic instincts, Allah raises you to a status above the malaika. That they didn't have to make, overcome these difficulties and you did. So you became better. And on the other hand, he says, but if you ignore your intellect and you don't pay attention to your intellect, then you're worse than an animal that you could have made a better decision based on your intellect, but there was no benefit of your intellect. So therefore you're worse than an animal. Now, taking a look at this hadith, now let's take a look back. 
Why do we see similarities between animals and human beings? We see similarities between animals and human beings because of these baser instincts and these desires that are present in animals and are present in human beings. An animal, when it makes a decision, it doesn't think ahead to the intellectual aspect of what's beneficial for it in the long term, what's good for its akhirah, what's good for its family, what will benefit it 20 years from now. Otherwise, cheetahs and lions would have come up with refrigerators long ago. Kill in the hot season and then save it. But they don't have an intellect. They can only satisfy the immediate desire that they have. When we see a similarity or we see a humanistic characteristic in an animal, we're seeing the similarity that an animal has a desire. When it fills, it fulfills its desire, it reminds me of myself because when I have a desire, I want to fulfill my desire. When I see an animal having a similar characteristic to a human being, it's because when I do something to make that animal happy, it becomes happy like I become happy. When I do something to upset that animal, it becomes angry the way I become angry. When we start seeing our society focusing on these similarities between animals and ourselves, we should recognize that society has forgotten the importance of the intellect. They've foregone their intellect, they put it to the side. And they decided that all of my life, my focus in my life is based on satisfying my desires and satisfying my needs. Making sure I don't get angry and I stay happy and I get what I want. The more we see society humanize animals, the more we recognize that they've foregone their intellect. They're not thinking about their akhirah anymore. They're not thinking about what's good for them in the eyes of Allah. They're not thinking about what will make them a better human being. They're only thinking about, I want something and I want to have it. The same way when I see an animal, it has the same desires as I do. This aspect of seeing animals as human beings is reducing the status of a human being. It's not raising the status of an animal. It's reducing the status of a human being. Look at what Allah is describing when He says, I lowered you to the lowest of the low. Meaning you became like animals. Your behavior became like animals, except those who keep faith and do good deeds. Faith is an action that a human being performs, possesses, develops, that has no immediate benefit to him. I don't see the results of my faith immediately in front of me. As a matter of fact, this is a conflict that we have. We say, I became a better mu'min. I sacrificed for the sake of Allah. My life didn't get better. My life got more difficult. Why? Because the more faith you possess, the harder the test is, not easier the test is. If by practicing my faith, life became easier and better, and faithful people had a better life than non-faithful people, what was the point of heaven? Why should there be a heaven? The reward is here. No. Rather, faith is that object that a man possesses because of his intellect, because he says, I know the Creator will reward me in Akhirah after this phase is completed. Faith is that aspect of a personality where they acknowledge, they say that something comes after this life, that this, there's more to my existence than this world. And I need to prepare for that phase. The same way with good deeds. You see, some of us perform good deeds because they make us feel good. An animal, when it does an action, it does it for the reward that it feels or the good emotion that it feels. But a human being is the one who performs a good deed knowing the pleasure of the Khalik, not the pleasure of himself. And prefers the pleasure of the Creator over the pleasure of himself. And we see this, that this is the priority. Our goal in life is the preference of the pleasure of the Khalik over the pleasure of ourselves. That's what a good deed is. When you perform a good deed, don't perform a good deed that people will acknowledge you and recognize you and reward you. Because then that means that you did it for dunya. To do a good deed for akhirah is to know that I don't want the recognition, I don't need the recognition, and I don't care about it. People should not know the good things that I do. They should not reward me for it. And if they don't reward me, it doesn't make me angry. The best example of this we see when we look in the Quran and we look at the example of the house of Amir al-Mu'mineen and Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra, salamullah.
ويطعمون الطعام على حبه مسكينا ويتيما واسيرا انما نطعمكم لوجه الله لا نريد منكم جزاء ولا شكورا The example comes to us where Allah has chosen to retell the story of the family of Rasulullah, the family of the Ahlul Bayt, in the instance where Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein became sick. And Amir al-Mu'mineen Sayyidah Zahra went to Rasulullah and they said to Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, Hassanan have become ill. And Rasulullah said, keep another, that if they become healthy, you will perform an act of ibadat to Allah. This nadar, this ahad, is an important aspect of our own day-to-day -day life. That when we find ourselves in a difficulty, or we have a need, or we have something we want, and we're finding obstacles in our way of reaching that, we make an oath, or we ask Allah for His assistance. One of the ones that's famously mentioned that Recently, one of the other scholars who I speak with, he mentioned to me, he says, I have found something very useful. Sometimes it happens that someone wants to go to Ziyarat and they can't find a way to go to Ziyarat. The visa isn't coming, the paperwork is a problem, the job won't give them time off. He says what many people have tested and told that's true is that make another. That's when you get to Karbala, you will recite Ziyarat Waritha and give the hadiyah of this ziyarah to Babul Hawa'ij, Abul Fadl al Abbas. And he says, by making this oath and this commitment, people who said that it was impossible for us to go, there was no way for us to go, they have said we stood in front of the haram of Imam Hussein. But the idea of making another, making an oath, is a way by which we can fulfill our legitimate desires and ask for the assistance of Allah, and we fulfill that commitment and promise. Back to our story. Rasulullah says, make an oath. And Amir al-Mu'mineen say the Zahra make an oath, they keep a nadar, they say that if our children will become healthy from this illness, we will fast for three days. And sure enough, Alhamdulillah, Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein become healthy. And Amir al-Mu'mineen say the Zahra make a commitment, we're going to fast for three days. Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein say, we will fast with you. And Fidda who was in the house says, I will fast with you as well. And these personalities in the house, they gather together and they fast. And they fast. And when it comes time to open their fast on the first day, a miskeen comes and comes to the door and says that I'm hungry, I have no food, please give me food. And the Ahlul Bayt, instead of opening their fast with the food, they give the food to the poor person and they open their fast with water. The second day comes and they fast again. Now a yatim, an orphan comes and the orphan comes and comes to the door at the time of opening the fast asks for food and the Ahlul Bayt give their food away again. And the third day a prisoner comes and again asks for the food and the Ahlul Bayt give away their food. So three days they fasted. And three days the only thing they opened their fast with was water. At the end of the third day when Rasulullah comes to see them, he sees that their faces have been worn away from the fasting and the difficulty of only opening their fast with water and he makes dua and food comes for them and brings food for them. And Allah reveals this verse these two verses they are those people who give food to the poor person the orphan and the prisoner and they don't want any reward from it except for the pleasure of Allah this is the idea of preferring your intellect over your physical desires the physical need that these personalities had was to feed themselves because they had been fasting their physical desire was to eat something, not even desire, their necessity was. But they forewent that characteristic in the favor of what they knew their intellect would prefer, which was the pleasure of Allah. And that's our goal, is that when you and I make decisions, we prefer our intellect. And we make the decision that will please Allah over the decision that would please ourselves or fill our own stomachs. Or make us happy and fulfill our desires. That when you have an opportunity to do something that Allah loves or do something that is more pleasurable for you, you prefer the pleasure of Allah over your own desires. You guys still with me? We're okay? So now let me ask you the question. Should animals be treated the same as human beings? Who says yes? I'm going to put the microphone in front of you say yes. No. It's not possible. Because the human being has superiority over the animal when he uses his aql and intellect that Allah has given to him. 
This aql and intellect is the basis of which this exam on this earth exists. Which is why the test to get into heaven is for us, not for animals. Bonus question afterwards if you can come to me and tell me there are only two animals that are noted to be allowed into heaven. Who are those two animals? Afterwards. When we talk about the idea of the intellect and the importance and the preservation of the intellect, it doesn't mean that now because man is superior to animal, that he should mistreat animals. Or that animals have no rights and no place. And that however an animal is treated is treated, it doesn't have an intellect, there's no value to it. No. The sign of our intellect is that we never mistreat any of Allah's creations. How can I ask for the mercy of Allah when I abuse and mistreat His creation? Our Holy Prophet says, ala man al -haywan. The curse of Allah be on the one who abuses and causes harm to animals. Our Holy Prophet gave many examples about the idea of the importance of treating animals well. In one story he narrates, he says there was a prostitute whose all of her sins were forgiven. Ya Rasulullah, someone like that. All of her sins were forgiven? All of her sins were forgiven. How? Rasulullah says that this prostitute, one day she was walking and she saw a dog who was thirsty next to a well. And she took off her shoe and she took water in her shoe to quench the thirst of the dog. By this action of quenching the thirst of that dog, Allah forgave all of her sins. That is Allah. All of her sins? All of her sins. Look at the importance Allah has put on the humane treatment of animals. And that it's an important characteristic that if you want to be a pious person and a good human being, that you have to take care of all of Allah's creations because the intellect submits to it. Now the question comes now. And I think we have some time. Are you guys with me? We're still awake? Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Very briefly, always remember something. These majalis are not a comprehensive discussion of these topics. They are an introduction to an ideology and a thought process. The responsibility falls on the listeners now that they take these pieces and these kernels of introduction to a thought process and they develop them. So when we sit here, we don't give a complete comprehensive overview because it's not possible that in a 40 minute majlis or one hour majlis that every aspect of a topic should be detailed and outlined and you have every piece of information. Rather, it introduces you to your thought process how it needs to be when you research this information. So for example, when we talk about the intellect, there are books and books written on the intellect and how to purify your intellect, how to improve your intellect, what's the benefit of having an intellect. There are even narrations about Allah talking about and there's an entire discussion about it. What did Allah create first? Was it the nur of Rasulullah? There are other narrations that say it was the intellect that was created first. There are other narrations that talk about different creations of Allah that came first. And there's an entire discussion about the association between the Ahlul Bayt and the intellect. We don't have time to get through. So the same way, don't imagine that these are comprehensive discussions. Rather, they are introductions to how to straighten out and formalize your thought process so that you don't get lost when you read and learn about different things. To that end, the question comes when we talk about the humane treatment of animals and the appropriate treatment of animals that is it right for Mu'mineen and the Muslimin to be vegetarians because of the mistreatment of animals or because the animal was made as Allah describes and Allah tells how the cattle were made for you to have food from them that we were meant to be meat eaters and everybody should eat meat and that eating meat is the most important thing that you can do and it's the best thing that you can do so the question comes, the argument for vegetarianism is what? Is to say that the system of farming and raising animals is harsh and harmful. Or that these animals possess characteristics like human beings. That they have families, the way Allah describes that they were created in Ummah. They have units and structures and by going out and eating these animals, we destroy these family units, we mistreat these animals and we shouldn't do it. And therefore it's wrong to eat animals. There's one discussion. The other discussion is, is Allah created them for us to eat, eat as much as you can. And the balance and the answer is the balance between these two points. There is a narration from Amir al Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam.
where he says, and this is narrated by both Sunni and Shia sources, it's located in both Bihar al Anwar and some Sunni books as well, too. Man taraka lahman arba'ina yawman sa'a khalqahu wa man dawama alayhi arba'ina yawman qasa qalbahu. That Amir al Mu'mini narrates, he says that our Holy Prophet Rasulullah said to me, he said that one who avoids meat for 40 days, his flesh fades away and washes away. And in the same statement, he says, and one who eats meat for 40 days cons consistently, his heart becomes hard. In other narrations, we have statements that describe and say that one who eats meat constantly, Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. That one who eats meat constantly develops the characteristics of animals within him. So on the one side we see these narrations that are telling us that you should eat meat and if you don't eat meat you'll waste away and that you'll lose certain characteristics that are unique to you as a human being. And on the other side we're seeing narrations that are talking about if you eat too much meat you'll become like the animals and your hearts, hearts will become hard. So when we take a look and we see in the etiquette of ta'am and the etiquette of eating and drinking and there's an entire section in Bihar there are many attributes about these characteristics. Some of these characteristics, for example, talk about it is mustahab to eat meat at least once every three days. And in other narrations, it's makroob to eat meat twice in one day. So the idea is, is that meat is a part of our diet and we should have it as a part of our diet, however, not in excess. How did this excess come to play? And this, we'll mention this very quickly, that one of the realities, because many times how this comes about in our character, in our culture, it happens very naturally and we don't pay attention to it. Historically, meat was something rare and difficult and was a luxury item. That it was difficult to get a hold of and a difficult process to access and have for yourself. And by that difficulty, people did not have meat on a frequent basis. They had it very rarely. However, when many of our families moved from those third world countries, moved from India and Pakistan and they came here, meat suddenly became much more easily available. And its familiarity as being a luxury item promoted that meat should be something that's consumed more frequently and available more frequently in our houses. And gradually, without paying attention, it became a habit that now every meal has to have meat in it. Along with that, the process is we stop paying attention to the fact of where does meat come from? How is this animal raised? How is the etiquette and the akhlaq of taking care of these animals processed in a community and a society? And we started seeing the negative effects in our character. Our goal in all of these aspects of whether we deal with animals and how we interact with them or how we prefer meat and how we go through these processes is the preference of our intellect. That our intellect tells us that Allah created this item with a benefit for us and we should take advantage of that benefit. But we should ensure that our desires and our needs don't make it excessive and difficult for us to prefer our intellect. If you want to see the preference of intellect in a society and the best examples of preferring intellect, look at the Ashab of Imam al Hussein. These were the companions who, when they saw the difficulties before them, when they knew the challenges they would face, they preferred to prefer their akhirat and the companionship of Imam Hussein over the comforts of this life. Look at personalities like Zuhair ibn Qayyim. Zuhair ibn Qayyim was someone who was amongst the enemies of Amir al muminin But when Imam Hussein came to him and approached him and said, Oh Zuhair, join me as my supporter. Zuhair turned and he said to his wife, he said, I divorce you and I give you my wealth, leave me alone, I go to Hussein ibn Ali. That these companions like Wahb al-Kalbi, Wahb al-Kalbi in many narrations was reported to be a Christian man who with his new bride and his mother was passing by the field of Karbala and they saw the flags of Imam Hussein and they turned and they went to see if they should help or be involved. Wahab al-Kalbi narrates, he says, I went to go speak to Aba Abdullah, I found him in a state of need. I returned back to my mother and my wife and I asked them, what do you think we should do? Should we help them or should we leave them? And Wahab al-Kalbi, his new wife, she said, leave them be. We've just gotten married. Let's go about our business. And the mother of Wahab al-Kalbi turned and said, no Wahab, help him and support him and don't leave him alone. 
The day of Ashura, the narrators write that Wahab al-Kalbi was one of the first who was sent to fight. And he was sent to fight against two enemies. And as he was fighting, three of his fingers had been cut off in the battle. After he finished the enemies of Imam al Hussein, he went back to the tents to bandage his fingers. When he went back to bandage his fingers, he says, as I returned to the tent, my wife came running out to me, Wahab, why did you return to me alive? Why are you coming back to the tents alive? Go and fight and die in the way of Hussein ibn Ali. Wahab said, why are you pushing me like this? A moment ago, a day ago when I spoke to you, you said, leave Hussein. Now today that I come back alive for a moment just to bandage my fingers, you say, why didn't you die for Hussein? What changed in you, O woman? She says, I didn't know how alone Hussein ibn Ali was when I told you to leave him. Now that I have seen the son of Zahra in difficulty, I can't stand that my husband should live when the son of Zahra is in difficulty. If you want to see the promotion of intellect over the desires of this world, look at the concept and the example of Habib ibn Madahir. Habib ibn Madahir is not a normal personality. There is a narration that says that Rasulullah was once walking the market with Madahir, the father of Habib. And Habib was walking in the back with Imam al Hussein. And they were children. And all of a sudden, Rasulullah turns from Madahir, turns around and grabs Habib and begins to kiss this child. Madahir says, Ya Rasulullah, did my son do something wrong? Is something different about him? What happened that you began and you left our conversation, began kissing Habib? Rasulullah replied, Oh Madahir, us anbiya are not like normal people. We can see behind us the same way we can see in front of us. As you and I were walking in the market, oh Madahir, I saw your son Habib. He was walking behind my Hussein. And as Hussein would walk, Habib would take the dirt from under the feet of Hussein and kiss it. I love this characteristic of Habib so much that I had to kiss him. Habib was a companion of Amir al Mu'mineen in the battle of Jamal, in the battle of Nahrawan, in the battle of Safin. And Amir al Mu'mineen had told him, Oh Habib, you will be someone who is martyred and dies the death of a shaheed. After the battle of Safin, Habib came to Amir al Mu'mineen dejected. He says, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, you promised me shahada. The battles have ended, but I am still alive. Why did you forsake me? Did I do something wrong that Allah has not granted me shahada? And Amir al Mu'mineen replies, No, Habib, you will be shaheed in the hands of one where your shahadat will be greater than if your shahadat was in my hands. And Habib says, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, in whose hands could my shahadat be greater than in your hands? He says, oh Habib, you will die as a companion of my Hussein ibn Ali. You will be martyred with him thirsty and hungry. And Habib waited for that day. Today when you go to Karbala, you see that there is the maqam al shuhada you see there is the grave and the dhariha of Abu Abdullah, and to the front and to the side is a grave that is separate from the others, and this is the grave of Habib ibn Madahir. Habib, as a friend of Imam al Hussein and as a personality and as a senior member of the Ansar of Medina, had a special status in the army of Imam Hussein. He was the leader of all of the companions. And it is said that Habib is the one who keeps track of the names of the supporters of Imam Hussein. That when you go to Karbala and you go to the grave of Habib, ask him to write your name amongst the Ashab and the companions of Imam Hussein. That he is the one who keeps track of these affairs. But look how it came to be that Imam Hussein called this personality. That in Karbala, when the armies began to come and the supporters of Umar Saad came, army after army, the companions of Imam Hussein didn't increase, but rather they decreased. There were some personalities who, when they saw these armies coming and saw the massing of soldiers against Imam Hussein, they ran in fear. And at one point in time, Sayyidah Zainab turned and she said, Oh brother, the supporters of our enemies come every day. Is there no one who will come to help us? Is there no helper for us? And Imam Hussein said, I will send a letter to my friend and he will come to our aid. Habib being alone in Kufa in a state of difficulty and not having the supporters was waiting for the day that he would be the supporter of Imam Hussein. One day when they were sitting to dinner, the wife of Habib says, Ha, ah, Habib, I have good news for you. Habib says, what news do you have for me? His wife says, she says, last night I had a dream. And in my dream, I saw Sayyidah Zahra had been dressed in black and sitting and crying. 
I went before her, I sat before her on my knees and I said my salam. She said to me, who are you? I said, I am Umm Al-Qasim, I am the wife of Habib. She says, Sayyidah Zahra oh Habib has sent her salam to you. And she has said that the day that your beard will be colored with your own blood, Habib is coming. Habib became excited and as they sat to dinner, a knock came at the door and they said, who has come to our door? And the man replied, I am the messenger of Hussein ibn Ali. The messenger gave a letter, Habib read this letter. And in it, it said that this is from Hussein ibn Ali to Habib. The time has come that we are in need of your assistance. Will you come to us? Habib sitting there looks at the letter and Umm Qasim, the wife of Habib turns and she says, Oh Habib, what did our master write? And Habib replied, that my Imam has said that he is in a state of difficulty and he has asked for me to go to his aid. Umm Qasim turned and she says, Oh Habib, what are you thinking? He's saying, while I would like to go, I'm worried about what will happen to you and my son after you. Who will take care of you? What will happen to your affairs? This question of Habib is not necessarily out of his desire for worldly affairs or concern for his material wealth. But rather, it is a question that was asked to see what would be the condition of the nasl he left behind. The same way that we saw Hujar ibn Adi, when Hujar ibn Adi was going to be killed by the soldiers of Muawiyah, what did he say? He said, kill my son first. I want to see my son die before my eyes. They said, oh Hujar, we wanted to honor you, that it's difficult for a grown man to see his son killed before his eyes. So we thought we would kill you first. Well, Hussein, now they didn't even offer you the courtesy that they wouldn't kill your son in front of you. Hujar said, but no, I worry that if I should die, that seeing my death would affect my son, that maybe he would leave the wilayat of Ali ibn Abi Talib. So kill my son before me, so that I know my nasl will end with the love of Ali ibn Abi Talib. In the same way now, Habib ibn Madahir is not asking his wife out of concern, that ha, huh, who will pay the bills, who will bring food, where will your rent come from? He wants to see that will my dying for Hussein ibn Ali make my lineage weak and away from the Ahlul Bayt. Look at the answer and the support that the wife of Habib gives. Um Qasim says, oh Habib, take these bracelets, take this chadar and you sit in the house. I will go to the aid of Hussein ibn Ali. Habib replied, how gharib my master has become that even the women prefer to support him and they want to help him. Habib says, no, I just wanted to see your answer, I will leave. But the condition of Kufa was that Habib could not leave during the day. So he says, my servant, take my horse outside of Kufa and take him as if you were taking him to graze. At night, I will go for a walk and I will exit Kufa and I will meet you and I will take the horse and go to my master. Habib says in the middle of the night, it became very late in me avoiding the security and leaving the city, that when I came close, I could hear my servant speaking to my horse. He was saying to the horse, he says, oh horse, don't worry. If for some reason our master doesn't come, I will still take you to the aid of our son and the grandson of the Prophet. I will ride your back and I will go to Hussein ibn Ali. Don't worry, our destiny has been written with Hussein. Habib again, his throat closed and his eyes teared. Oh master, how difficult is your condition that even the slaves want to have mercy on you. Even the slaves desire to go to your aid. Habib turned to his slave, he says, I have come to go to my master. I set you free, O slave, that you have no responsibility to me. The slave sits in the ground and he says, O Habib, you kept me through all of the affairs. But now that you turn to heaven and you go to the family of Rasulullah, you leave me behind. The slave begged, O Habib, take me to my master Hussein. Let me be in his aid. These two, they took their horse. They rode to Imam al Hussein. They arrived at the camp of Imam al Hussein. A, a cry arose from the supporters of Imam Hussein in happiness that a supporter had come. Habib still doesn't understand how alone my Imam was until Sayyidah Zainab says, O Fizza, who came that my brother is pleased? The answer came that Habib has come from a distance. Zainab said, Give my brother Habib my salam. Habib at this point in time could take it no more. He sat on his knees in the desert and began to cry, 
O oh, difficult situation and time of the Ahlul Bayt, that the princess of all of the Arab, she's one like Habib as a brother. Why was the family of Rasulullah forsaken as such?